All right, good afternoon, everybody. I'm a minute late, but we'll be okay. All right. So today is going to be our, uh, for the most part, our final, our big final lecture, which I'm sure everyone's happy about. But before we get into it, kind of, I just want to talk about the schedule. Um, all right, so today we're going to have a, dis a discussion about the discussion, uh, as well as talk a little bit about the final paper. And then we're going to finish up correlations and call them beyond analyses, but a couple of analyses beyond a correlation. This coming Friday, no class. Next Monday, going to have a little short lecture about presentations. So I'm going to talk about the presentations, talk a little bit more about them, give you um, a couple examples and a, and a couple templates that you can use that you and your group can use. And then there will be to the remainder of the class is going to be time for you and your group to get together and start working on the presentations. They're just 10 minutes long. Um, we'll talk more about them uh, next week. So I don't want to get into it today, but don't worry too much. They should be fairly easy. Uh, July 28th, so next Wednesday, um, no class. This is time for you to get together in your group to continue working on your presentations, um, you know, practicing whatever you need to do. That Friday will be an optional class. Come to class if you have any questions about exam number three. Um, later today, potentially tomorrow, I'll be sending out that example data set with a couple example questions for that open-ended section, as well as your traditional study guide for the uh, closed section. So be on the lookout for that. Probably it's going to be tomorrow. I, I, I won't be able to get it done tonight. And then also come if you need any on that Friday, if you need any help with the presentation or your paper. There'll be a plenty of time on that Friday to uh, talk about that. So yeah, that Friday optional class. Come to, cl come to class if you have any questions about the exam. Uh, the exam is on August 2nd, so that Monday. Um, for the final exam, we'll talk more about it if you want next, next Friday on this exam reveal. But some very brief information, uh, the open notes or the, the closed note section, section, so the traditional multiple choice, like 15 questions, uh, will be available all day. So don't worry about you know, time-wise with that. You have all day. Use the Respondus Lockdown Browser. You don't need the camera. Um, shouldn't take you that long because it's, a, it's, it's short. However, for the open-ended section, this is very important. You must be here in this class on Zoom at 1.30 to receive the open note section. So if you're not here, you're not going to be able to do this portion of the final exam, which is worth, I, I don't know what it's worth right now, but it's probably going to be three quarters, maybe over half of the actual final exam um, grade. So if you're not here, not going to do well on the final exam, probably going to fail it if you're not here in class. So do make sure that you are here on final exam day to do this. If you're if you have a problem, um, if you know that, you know, for whatever reason, you're not going to be here, let me know as soon as possible. Um, so that way we can work around it. And then at the end of that week, August 4th and August 6th, so that Wednesday and Friday of the final week, will be presentations. Um, we split, a, split the presentations across the two days. And then a final paper is due August 6th. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about the final paper today, but there is an opportunity to get plus 10 bonus points for submitting it early, but I'll get to that. So yeah, so this is the schedule. I uh, just want to talk about the schedule for the remainder of the week, or for the remainder of the semester. Uh, this is assignment. So this is just a slide. I'm not going to go too deep into it, but here are just some a common assignment 11 problems. Um, this is a big one, and I'm actually going to show you how to do this. Rename your variables to something other than like what I called them. So a lot of you gave me like scatter plots, and the variable names were just the original variable names, and it just doesn't look good. I want to show you how to change them. So traditionally, you know, you run a scatter plot. Let me just do that real fast. Simple scatter plot. Okay, and this is a simple. This is a scatter plot that uh, you know SPSS outputs. And you can see here that these variable names aren't cleaned, right? It says self-esteem underscore final variable. 
and this one on the y-axis says group four underscore final variable. Well, that doesn't tell me anything, right? If I'm looking at your graph, well, what does group four final variable, what is it actually measuring? So there's a couple ways to change this. On the actual graph, and it does say this in the graph homework assignment, I believe, assignment number six, but you can just double click the graph. It'll open up kind of this chart editor and a new page. And then just double click, click a couple of times on the variable names and you can rename them. So I can rename that to self-esteem and whatever group four is actually measuring. Um, let's just say it's, it's social media addiction, social media addiction. All right, so that's how you can rename your var variables. Just double click on them in the actual SPSS output and they'll open up that chart editor and then you can edit it there. But there's also another way you can do it. In, um, so this is just a, a group four's data set, but everyone can do this. So you go to variable view. So you go to this tab on the bottom, variable view. And then under label, just call it what it, you know, just call it whatever you're measuring. So you can call it social media addiction, right? Whatever your group is measuring, exercise, body image, whatever. So you can rename the variables here under this label column. You can use spaces. Remember in the, uh, in the name section of SPSS, you can't use spaces for some reason, kind of dumb. But under this label, you can use spaces. And then if I were to go ahead and rerun this scatter plot, because I put the names or the correct labels under label, it will then just apply that to the graph for you. So you don't have to edit the graph. So if you have trouble editing the graph with the names, just go ahead and put whatever you wanted to call under the label section in SPSS under variable view, and it will all, and then it will apply it to whatever analyses that you do, correlation tables, whatever. So if you, you know, if you're using this scatter plot for your uh, for your paper, do make sure that you change the variable names. All right. Showed you how to do that. These next two points um, are just saying, hey, make sure you have all of the correct information. Not going to go into these um, just because the homework assignments already do it and already say, hey, you need these questions or you, you need these sentences. So that's just here for you to you know, come back to this PowerPoint and double check. I have this slide here. This is just an example uh, paragraph. Like it's the entire results paragraph. And I have it broken down by color. Um, in red is the descriptive part. In this peach color is your one sample t-test. And in this white section is the Pearson correlation with the statistics and the um, plain English like interpretation right after it. Not gonna go in, you know, we've talked about how to create these paragraphs in PowerPoints before. Just wanted to have it up again so that way you can come back and double check it. Um, I've said this multiple times, but I, I do wanna say it again. Please make sure that if we're giving you these like APA write-ups, please make sure you're using them both on the paper and the exam. Um, there were several, there's several times with several people, like with multiple people where you don't use like this exact, like Pearson correlation APA write-up. Like this is exactly what your results pick section should look like. You know, obviously change out the, the numbers, change out the variable names, if it's a negative correlation, make sure you know you apply that negative correlation logic. If there is no correlation, make sure you apply that no correlation logic and wording. But for the most part, your paragraph should look exactly like this in your results section. Um, yeah, so don't feel the need to like, oh, let me throw in synonyms or change up the sentence structure. No, just copy and paste it and change out the, the information that you need to. Um, I can't say that enough because I, I, no matter how many times I say it throughout the semester, and this is for every class that I've taught before, I'll still get, you know, students who um, feel the need to get creative in these paragraphs, don't feel the need to get creative in the results paragraph or in the methods section. Those are pretty cut and paste cookie cutter paragraphs. All right. Um, yes, yeah, so that's just a quick overview of assignment 11 common problems. Don't want to get into it too much. Just make sure that um, in your final in your final paper that you respond to the feedback and you're also going back to the assignments to make sure that you hit everything that you need to hit. So yeah, let's just do a quick, let me talk a little bit more about the discussion. 
Um, but this is just an overview of the paper. We've seen this multiple times, but for the most part, you should, if you've been keeping up with the assignments, you should have all of this done except the discussion, which we'll talk about today. So putting it all together, first, uh, the title page, most of you have the title page down. I gave you the template already. Um, if not, I'm going to throw up another student paper on eCampus, but, you know, make sure it looks like this. I know we didn't go into really what makes up a title page and how to do it in APA, but I give you a template. All you need to do is change out your information, like your title. So do make sure you have that. Um, yeah, so make sure this all comes together like in a final paper format. This is what your drafts actually are supposed to be. I didn't really take off points for it. Actually, I didn't take off points at all. But like, you know, for assignment number 11, it was supposed to look like a draft of your paper, um, not like in the actual homework assignment. So it should have been in a Word document, you know, properly formatted. Didn't take points off, but make sure for your final paper, it's all formatted properly and make sure you edit using all of your feedback all the feedback that I gave you. All right, so let's just do a really fast discussion um, conversation. So what's the focus of the discussion? What's the point of it? Well, it has several points actually, and a lot of important points. So first you just interpret your results. You know, was your hypothesis significant? Well, first off, what was your hypothesis? What was your research question? Was it significant or not? That, you know, that's your first paragraph. Then you need to talk about how do your findings fit into this bigger picture of the research issue. So all of you should have, you know, at least two paragraphs in your one or two paragraphs in your introduction where you say, hey, here's what previous research has found. Well, how do your findings fit in with previous research? Then you also need to discuss any theoretical implications. You know, does this support what theory has said or does it go against what theory has said? And all of you should have a paragraph in your introduction where you talk about theory, right? There's a whole paragraph where it's supposed to be, here's why we think our IV is related to our DV. And then you suggest the next steps in your research process. So let's go a little bit more detail about each paragraph. So you can see I have these numbered, and this is kind of what we would expect in your, in your discussion section. The first paragraph should be the summary. And this is just your main results. So what was the result of your correlation? Just in plain English, no numbers, right? We just want that simple English, you know, what did you find? Hey, there was a positive correlation between X and Y. Participants who reported more of this reported more of that. over here. Also throw this over here. Yeah, so that's just that first paragraph of the discussion. And then so was your hypothesis supported or not? This is a great time to bring, you know, bring back your bring back up, excuse me, your hypothesis. You know, hey, our research question was this. We hypothesized this. Our results showed this. They did they supported or did not support our hypothesis. The second paragraph, and this may take more than one paragraph for some people, but at a minimum, it needs to be at least one paragraph, is this connection to previous literature. How do the results fit in? So how do your results of your correlation fit in with previous research and or theory? If it's as predicted, explain the connections. If it's different, maybe ex you know, explain the difference. Hey, we didn't find a relationship and maybe speculate why. Hey, here's some reasons why. So make sure you cite specific studies from the intro. So this isn't going to require you to do a lot more research because if you wrote a decent intro the way we, we the way we told you to, where you have paragraphs that say, "Hey, here's um, several research studies that shows our two variables are related." Maybe you also have another paragraph which was recommended in your introduction that say, "Hey, maybe they aren't related," and here's some research that shows they aren't as related as other research has said. Well, in your discussion, reference those studies that you talked about in your intro and say, hey, our research supports the findings of this researcher. You know, in this research study, they found that exercise was related to self-esteem. You know, and, and this other study also showed that exercise was related to self-esteem. Our results were similar. 
and you know expand on that a little bit more. And if your study contradicts you know your 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 previous findings, maybe try to find some research that supports yours. Or you can you know also talk about hey our research did not support the findings of these other researchers, and maybe here's some reasons why. And this is for you to come up with, um, because you all have read the literature, so you should have some general understanding of what researchers say about your two variables because you have done an introduction and a lit review. So you should have the ability to sit down and really think, well, maybe why didn't we find a significant relationship? Using what you know about your research, as well as method design. We talked a lot this semester about designing a study. Maybe there's a problem with your variables that you know of. And you can write about that here. Then you talk about this big picture question, what has your study contributed? Um, this can go into this connection to previous literature, but, you know, try to, uh, you know, expand upon the previous theory. So if there is, you know, a theory for why social media is related to negative outcomes, right, maybe apply your research, if that's what you found, to, you know, some of the theories out there. All right, a couple more. So then you need to have a paragraph on limitations and future directions. These, this can be the same paragraph. So what are some possible limitations of your study? Was it the sample? Was it the, you know, the analyses, the design, you know, whatever it is. You know, if you got results that weren't significant, how might these limitations have contributed? You know, was it the sample? Was it, you know, for whatever your limitations are, could that possibly explain why you did not find a relationship, even though you expected there something, even though you expected a relationship to exist? And this is a great way to jump into future directions. So you should, you can suggest some next steps. You know, what do you still need to know? What do you suggest as a researcher that we do? You know, do we do it again using different measures? You know, maybe better measures, maybe physiological measures. This is up to you. Talk about some future directions. What do we still need to know about your research topic? Or what would you like to explore more? And now I don't need you to completely change your design, right? Don't say, oh, we look at exercise and self-esteem, but what I, I think our future direction should be social media and self-esteem. Now you gotta keep it with your variables. You know, don't completely go radical and change up the design. And then this grand summary, you know, what is the take home message? If there was a positive correlation, how do you apply it to the real world? Now, we're not saying, you know, don't say, I'm not saying, you know, your IV causes DV, but you can kind of apply that logic, right? Remember, correlation does not imply causation. We'll actually talk a little bit more about that today. But if those two are related, maybe there's something that you can tell, um, you know, your readers, hey, our research suggests that having negative experiences on social media is related to lower self-esteem. So maybe, you know, people need to rethink their experiences on social media to be more positive, and that may be related to more positive outcomes. That could be a direction for future research and this take-home message. You know, exercise and self-esteem, body image and self-esteem, actually apply your findings to the real world and how can they be, how can your findings be used to help people? So think about this in that final grand summary paragraph. One of the things I'm going to highly suggest you do now, because this is a discussion, you know, and it's, we're not, you're not going to have a draft of this. It's just, gonna, well, you're not going to get feedback on this. So the grading is just going to be purely on effort for this discussion section. Go to um, the example papers and check out how they structured their discussion. Now, in this particular student example, it looks like it's, a full three pages. I don't expect you to have three pages at a minimum. At a minimum, what I would expect is probably at least a page and a half. If you can get a page and a half, making sure you have all of these paragraphs that you need, you'll be fine. You know, make an honest effort with it. Anything less than a page and a half, probably going to be, you know, some points off because you're missing something. Don't feel the need to get to three pages. Get to three pages if you want. Don't feel the need to. I know some of the student the student examples are a little bit longer, 
minimum page and a half, but really just make sure that you hit all of these, all of these, uh, these paragraphs. And there's some more instructions on the final paper assignment. So putting it all together, you know, you have all your drafts, you know, make sure you do the edits, put it all together. Also make sure you update your references to include everything you cited. Make sure all your references, both in text and in the paper, are in APA format. The appendix. So I know we didn't really talk about the appendices that much. You need to refer to them in the methods. I want to show you, okay, let me show you like the perfect appendice. All right. So these are this is an example of how your appendices should look. So it should say like appendix one or appendix A in bold centered at the top. And then it looks like this is the scale that they came up with. So this group came up with a physical activity scale. And so if you came up with a social media addiction scale, you know, just bold name up at the top, have your, res your, your response scoring just once. So, you know, zero through five, strongly disagree to strongly agree. And then just simply list out all of your questions. It's all you need to do. And then do the same thing for your validated scale, you know, perceived stress or your self-esteem, whether you do it like this, where you actually type it out or you find something that you can neatly, that's a key word here, neatly paste into the Word document, either way is fine, but this is what they should look like. Nice and neat, you know, properly, when I say properly formatted, I, I just mean it formatted in a way that it, it's easy to read. Some people give me things that like the formatting is all over the place. You know, try to make it as neat as possible in, in regards to these appendices. And then the figure, make sure your figure has a title that's in italics. You know, relationship between X and Y, whatever you want, simple. Your, your X and Y axis are clearly labeled. This is a little bit big for this graph, but that's fine. Make sure there's no like weird color. You can change the color of like the dots or whatever, but some people gave me graphs that like the entire background was like purple or something. Don't do that, keep it simple. And then a note at the bottom that just says, hey, the correlation between X and Y is shown here. There is or is not a significant relationship. You can kind of just talk about, just give the stats again one more time. So make sure you're checking the student exam, the student papers for examples in regards to the appendices, references, figures. Um, but yeah, so that information is here, going all in your final paper. And then this final paper assignment. So as with any assignment, there's a Word document on eCampus um, going over the final paper. It can be found under assignments. I believe it's up now. It might not be available. It, it will definitely be available after class. It's 90 points. It's due August 6th, so our final Friday class at 1.30 p.m. But if you submit it by August 1st, so this is that Saturday, or I think it's a Sunday, by Sunday at 9 a.m., you get 10 extra bonus points. So if you can imagine that's 10 extra bonus points out of a final paper homework, not, that's 90 points. It's pretty good, right? Um, yeah, it's pretty decent. So yeah, here's this final paper assignment. Um, it gives you a lot of important information, uh, like you know what goes into each section. Highly suggest you use this as a checklist to go through and make sure, oh, okay, so I have six references. I need at least six references. Okay, check, I can check that off. Each citation, so blah, blah, blah. So make sure, use this kind of as a checklist. Um, Also that idea of using a checklist. So you can see like an introduction, it gives you a couple bullet points of what you should have, but it just says like a second bullet point is like several paragraphs that discuss the literature and develops a study background. Go back to that introduction assignment and make sure that like you hit all the checkpoints that we talk about on the intro assignment, because you know, this, what like those several paragraphs is what, two paragraphs on your measures and how it was measured previously, a paragraph on previous literature, showing relationships between your two variables, a paragraph on theory. So make sure you have all that. And one way to do that is go back through the assignments and just check off that you know you have everything that you need. But this is a good starting point for this checklist. Make sure your final paper has all of this. And this is also how it will be graded. Um, yeah, make sure you read this, uh, the, the instructions, because it talks about late papers. If it's submitted, so it's like officially due on August 6th, 
like if you submit it after August 8th, you know, you're not going to get a grade for it. Um, it'll be a zero. So do make sure that you do read all of this so you get the maximum points that you can. Anyways, this can be found on eCampus. If not right now, definitely after class. All right, any questions about the final paper, the discussion section, anything that we've talked about so far? All right, not seeing anything in chat, no one's speaking up, so let's move on. Okay, so to, we're gonna finish up our conversation this semester with this idea that correlation does not imply causation. So this is a phrase that you've heard, you've heard many times, but now we're actually gonna talk about the logic of it. Why can't we say this causes that? So today is gonna be mostly focused on that, and then a little bit more on some analyses past correlations, just to get some of you stats people a little excited or you know looking into the future of things that you could possibly do. So remember, even if it's a strong correlation, you know, 0 0.895, 0 0.9, whatever, correlation does not imply causation. So let's, oh, here's some examples. Um, I kind of talked about this in the beginning of the semester, and I gave you a couple examples in the beginning of the semester, but these are some examples Dr. Tenenholtz uh, had on her PowerPoint. So this is actually coming from that same site that I talked about before, that like weird correlation site. But here is an example of almost a perfect correlation. So it's a, a R value of 0.99 between the divorce rate in Maine and how much the per capita consumption of margarine. So I don't think any, anyone wants to sit here Speak up if you do, but does anyone want to sit here and defend the idea that margarine is related to divorce? Probably not, right? I, if you do want to speak up and defend it, just going to stop you right now and say there is no, there is no defense for this. These two clearly are not related, right? Hopefully people can see that divorce and, and butter are not related, but there is a, almost a perfect correlation between the two. Interesting. A couple more, uh, U.S. spending on science, space, and technology, and suicides by hanging, strangling, strangulation, and suffocation, almost, again, a perfect correlation. Clearly, these two are not related, even though if you were to run a correlation, it would say they are. But you wouldn't want to say, hey, uh, suicide causes the U.S. to spend more on science and space, right? That's just, no. Here's another one. The age of Miss America is positively correlated with murders by steam, hot vapors, and hot objects. Really weird. Um, but yeah, so, you know, even though there's a positive correlation between, so the older Miss America, oh yeah, what positive correlation, older contestants or the old, uh, older contestants on Miss America, whatever it is, is not related to more murders, right? It just, it, these correlations just don't make any sense. So this brings up this idea of, oh, actually, before we get to that idea, we're gonna be talking about these two correlations several times in the next coming slide. So just think about this idea. So there's a significant positive correlation between the number of pairs of shoes a person owns and life expectancy. So more pairs of shoes equals higher life expectancy. Okay. More churches in a town is related to more violent crimes. These are two real correlations. So let's expand upon these a little bit. Let's expand into this logic of correlation does not equal causation. So in order to do it, if we look at a correlation, right, there are three explanations. Whenever A and B, so A and B are just two, two variables, right? We could say IV and DV, whatever, just two variables. So whenever A and B are correlated, there are three possible ex explanations. First explanation, A causes B, right? One of our variables causes the other variable. Well, because we're just doing a correlation, we could also say B causes A, potentially, right? 
Social media addiction causes depression. Depression also causes social media addiction. That could be another explanation between the relationship between these two variables. But here's a really important one, the third explanation. C causes both A and B. So C is just some third variable. There could be something else that is causing both A and B to be related. And this is kind of what we're going to be focusing on today. This idea that there could be some other variable causing A and B to be related. So let's apply that logic to these examples. So the number of pairs of shoes a person owns is positively correlated with life expectancy, right? We talked about this a slide ago. More shoes equal higher life expectancy. So let me do that. Let me apply those three explanations. First, we could say that A causes B. Shoe ownership causes a longer life. Does anyone want to sit here? want to speak up either in direct message or just unmute yourself. Does anyone want to defend this conclusion that shoe ownership causes a longer life? I'll give you 10 seconds if you want to speak up. All right, no one wants to take a stab at this, probably because it's, that's a hard argument to make, right? I couldn't think of anything that would be like, okay, shoe ownership causes a longer life. Now, that doesn't make much sense. Well, we could do B causes A. A longer life causes a person to own more shoes. This one might be plausible, right? As you get older, you just may accumulate more shoes. Okay, I could see it, but kids also have a lot of, a lot of shoes. The five-year-old I babysit, he owns like, 20 pairs of shoes. I and mean, you know, they're all cheap and made to get dirty. So maybe that this explanation also doesn't work as, as well. You know, most adults, unless you're a shoe collector, don't have, you know, 15 pairs of shoes that you can get dirty. Well, actually I'm a guy. So maybe, maybe, maybe girls do. I don't know. Maybe some girls do. But um, yeah, so, but age might not have a factor in this, right? So a longer life causes a person to own more shoes, maybe. So let's do that third possible explanation. There could be some other variable that's causing A and B to be related. And this, and there's multiple answers, but this could just be one, right? There's multiple things that could be doing it. But here's one, what about wealth? So wealthy people are probably gonna be more likely to own better shoes, or not better, more shoes, as well as have higher life expectancy because they can afford healthcare. Right, so wealthy people will have both more shoes and higher health care or high, higher life expectancy because they can afford to go to the doctor more. So there's this third variable, wealth, that's driving the relationship between shoes and life expectancy. And now there's Paul, there's multiple explanations for this third variable. This is just one of them, wealth. Here's another one, actually, I just, I just thought of. So what happens if you like to really exercise, right? And so people who exercise may own more shoes because they have some running shoes, you may have shoes for the gym, uh, you know, so you have multiple pairs of shoes, you know, your normal walking shoes, whatever. But people who exercise may be more likely to have more shoes and have higher life expectancy because they're exercising and it's related to physical health. So, you know, there might not be a direct relationship between between shoes and life expectancy, but there's some other third variable that's causing them to be related. Let's do another one with this finding. The number of churches in a town is positively correlated with the number of violent crimes. I'll do the first one. Churches, so A causes B, churches lead to violent crime. Does anyone wanna argue that more churches causes more crime? Probably not, right? That, for the sake of time, no. We probably can't make that argument. Someone give me, unmute yourself, someone give me the B causes A for this example. Uh, could it be that violent crime leads to um, more churches, like the number of churches? Yeah, good job. So B causes A, violent crime leads to more churches being built. 
maybe, right? Maybe if you live in an area and there's more crime, maybe you're more likely to want to go to church. So that could call, I, I don't know, that, that's still a hard argument to make. Someone give me either a direct message chat if you don't want to speak up, or you can speak up if you feel, if you feel uh, confident enough. Someone give me an example of this third variable. What else could be driving this relationship between churches and crime? What is both related to more churches and more crime? Could it be like the community you live in? Like that, like, if, like if one community is, um, uh, the one thing that comes to my mind is shameless because like they live in like, you know, they live in an area where it's kind of dangerous, kind of run down. Most of the people live in like a state of like poverty, if not poverty close to it. So like maybe how like well the community is based off the number of churches or violent crime. Okay, potentially. Um, I could sit here and say, this kind of tweaking your statement, but I could say poor people may be more likely to be religious. I think that might be true. I don't know if that's a true statement or not, but poor people may be likely to be more religious and poor people, also poor communities also have more crime. That is true. Poor communities have more pr crime. Poor communities may also be more likely to be religious. That could be. So the, 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 the beauty of this third variable is that if you can apply any logic, right? As long as you can apply some logic to it and test it, it could be true. Here is one that is just a little bit more simpler. Probably people are overthinking this, but larger towns, right? If you live in a large community, well, larger towns are, mo are more likely to have more churches and more crime, right? More crime just because there's more people. So this third simple explanation between this relationship between number of churches and, and crime, which, you know, that is a true correlation, but none of us would sit here and say churches cause crime. That's just, you know, that's or crime causes churches. That's the, 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 the that's an illogical explanation. But a better explanation is, well, larger towns have both more churches and more crimes. Or poorer towns have more or people are more religious which would mean more churches and more violent crimes because it's a poorer community so this third possible these uh this third extraneous variable some variable is causing your two variables to be related um yeah let's do one more so children who watch violent tv shows tend to be more aggressive I'm assuming this is something that a majority of you have heard, right? At some point, whether scientifically or just through, you know, I don't know, parents or whatever, children who watch violent TV shows tend to be more aggressive. Well, this is actually a pretty big debate in developmental psychology. So this could be true. Watching violent TV causes aggression. There's evidence that says this is true. There's also evidence that says the opposite. Aggression, so an aggressive child, leads to watching more violent TV. This is also true. But there's also many, I'm not going to say hundreds, but many of these third variables. Maybe the parenting techniques leads to both watching more violent TV and to aggressive child, right? A parent who really isn't involved with their children all that much. And I'm talking about like elementary school children so, or in middle school children. So parents who aren't really involved with their children, you know, both emotionally, actual parenting wise, these kids may just, you know, run around and do whatever they want. They may be more aggressive just because of reasons, right? Maybe they're fighting with their siblings um, or they're fighting with their with their other friends who parents also don't watch. So they could lead to aggression because the parents aren't watching the kid and it just through nature, the kid becomes aggressive. And then the kid is also just able to watch whatever TV they want, right? Because their parents aren't watching them. So a parent, this is punitive parenting, but it could be like a parent who doesn't care about their kid could cause their kid to be both aggressive and watch more violent TV. 
it may be that TV is not related to aggression at all, right? It, there could be a correlation, but it, it could be it, that correlation could just be random, right? It just happens to be correlated because this third other variable, parenting, is driving that relationship. So without further research, there is no way to determine which explanation is correct, right? It could be any of these three explanations. A causes B, B causes A, or some other variable. So anytime you get a positive or negative correlation, there's always multiple explanations for it. And without further research, you can never know which explanation is correct just by running a correlation. This is the logic for why correlation does not imply causation. Because just because there's a correlation, there could be multiple explanations. And these explanations are really different, right? In the terms of like statistics and, and think of like from a psychological standpoint, psychology research wants to understand why two things are related. And they really want to truly understand why. Because if you can change one, you can change the other. If you can change something, if you, in order, to, in order to change people's behavior, you're gonna have to change something else, right? In order to change depression, maybe I have to change people's social media use. So just doing a correlation, multiple explanations, and that is the real reason why we can't say correlation implies causality, or the reason why we say correlation does not imply causation. Give me a thumbs up. Does that idea make sense? Why we can't say correlation is related, it, it causes, what's the phrase? And correlation does not imply causation because there are multiple explanations for any correlation. And hopefully these examples show that. Cool. All right, I wanna go through these a little bit fast just because, um, sake of time. So here's some criteria for establishing causality. So let's say we do want to apply causality, right? This is something as researchers that we want to do, that we strive to do. So there's some, there's some criteria for being able to say something causes change in something else. First, this idea of covariation, simply the variables must be correlated, right? That's the first step. In order to say something causes change in something else, they have to be correlated. So at a basic level, they must be correlated. Good, we got that done. We got that concept down. This next concept is directionality. So by definition, logical definition, right? If we're saying something causes change in something else, well, obviously whatever's causing the change has to come first, right? It can't come second. The, the, the cause can't come after the effect. The cause always has to come before the effect just logically, unless you can, I don't know, unless you can alter time theoretical physics, right? The cause always must come before the effect. So this actually, you know, brings up a lot of debate and things like the relationship between intelligence and reading. So we know there's a positive correlation between intelligence, how smart someone is and how well they can read. But what comes first? Does intelligence come before reading ability? Or does reading ability also influence intelligence? People who can read better, can read more material, can understand that material better, therefore becoming more intelligent. But you have to have some sort of intelligence in order to be able to read and understand. What comes first, chicken or the egg here? Probably not either, right? Probably they're both related and it's multi-directional, but directionality may be suggested by theory. So there's some theories out there that, say, that may say reading comes first or intelligence comes first. And remember hypothesis testing and that, and that theory logic going back several slides ago, but directionality may be suggested by theory. And then this idea of elimination of extraneous variables. And this is that idea of, of that third variable problem that we that we discussed in the previous slides. So if we can eliminate those third variables by controlling for them, and I think we'll talk about that, we'll mention it here, but you statistically you can control these variables, these other variables, to really look at the relationship between your independent variable and your dependent variable. So these are the three 
main criteria for establishing causality. They must be related. The cause must come before the effect. And you've looked at slash eliminated these extraneous third variables. Criteria for establishing causality. Um, so this third variable problem is just rehashing this idea that we were talking about in the previous slide. Um, instead of a direct relationship between A and B, a third variable is associated in driving the relationship um, between A and B. So this third variable C. Here's some other examples, just for the sake of time, I don't wanna sit here and spend five minutes on each one talking about potential explanations, but ice cream truck, we'll do the first one. Ice cream truck sales are correlated with more crime. And that's actually a really strong correlation. Now I could do that A, ice cream truck sales causes crime, probably not true. Crime causes more ice cream to be eaten, also not true. Does anyone have an idea for that third variable? What could be driving this relationship? We'll just do one and we won't do the other two for the sake of time. Anyone have an idea? Is it summertime? Great. Temperature. People, you know, if you're out in the cold, right, crime goes up in the summer compared to the winter just because people are out and about and able to be outside. Um, you know, especially for places where it gets really cold, right? So, and then also because of the heat, more people eat ice cream. So therefore, because of the heat, there's more crime and there's also more ice cream sales. And that is why there's such a strong relationship. So there's this third variable. I'm gonna do the other two. People who take vitamins tend to exercise more, a whole bunch of explanations, but this could be driven by people who are health conscious. So people who are health conscious may take more vitamins and they may exercise more, which is causing those two to both go up. You know, we wouldn't say vitamins causes people to exercise. That's just not, you know, vitamins don't do that at all. Vitamins don't change your mentality. And we don't say exercising causes people to take more vitamins, that, those, that's not true. But people who are health conscious will both exercise more and take more vitamins. The larger a child's feet, the better that he or she tends to read. This, is, this could be driven by age. Older people both have bigger, bigger feet than, than children and they read better than children. Therefore, there's that correlation between child's feet and the ability to read better, right? Reading ability. So this is that third variable problem talk about it in previous slides, here it is again. To establish causality, so this is going back to that criteria for causality, to establish causality, all plausible third variables must be looked at, right? In order to truly say this is causes that, you gotta look at all these other third variables or fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth, you know, multiple variables and control them and look at them statistically to make sure they aren't driving that change. All right, we have 15 more minutes, so let's move on. Scientific approaches for establishing causality. So one of the biggest ones, and this is what you're gonna focus on on 204, is this idea of an experimental design. So this is actually what all of 204 is gonna be about, is designing an experiment. We designed a correlational study this semester. Next semester, you'll design an experiment. And what does the experiment do? Well, or why is it better? You can manipulate your independent variable. So all of you have an independent variable now. Some of it's, for some of you, it's exercise. Some of you, it's body image. Some of you, it's social media. Well, in an experimental design, you actually manipulate those variables. You as a researcher, you know, you put, you, you split them up, people into two groups, let's say, let's just say two groups, those who use social media and those who don't use social media for a week, and you see how that influences depression. So by manipulating that IV, you can see if it causes change in the dependent variable. This is the logic of an experimental design. By actually controlling that independent variable, you can see how that causes change in the dependent variable. So good experiments are carefully controlled. Something we'll talk a lot about, about in 204, carefully controlling experiments. Don't wanna you know, talk too much about this. Um, but what if we can't do an experiment? 
what about this idea of smoking and lung cancer? So if we, you know, to in, truly establish causality, you, should, you one of the biggest things to do is an experimental study where you manipulate your independent variable. Well, the independent variable here is smoking. So can we, and this is a rhetorical question, can we manipulate smoking? Yes, we can, right? We could say, hey, some of you smoke, some of you don't smoke. And we could see how that causes change in something. But this relationship between smoking and lung cancer, in order to do a true experiment, right? We would have to get a bunch of babies and say, okay, you, we will get a hundred babies and say, hey, at, we'll take 50 of them and say, hey, at age 18, you're gonna start smoking a pack a day. And then the other 50 babies will say, you'll never smoke a cigarette in your life. And we will you know, make sure to control that. And we'll force them to, you know, we'll force those 50 babies to start smoking at 18 years old, a pack a day. And we'll see how that influences lung cancer. That is the true way to do an experiment on this idea of smoking and lung cancer. Hopefully you can all see that is wildly unethical, right? It is highly unethical to make people smoke. Think about abuse. We're interested in the relationship between abuse, child abuse, and I don't know, outcomes later in life, whatever your outcome is. Once again, we'd have to sit there and go, okay, you 50 kids are gonna be abused. You 50 kids are not gonna be abused and live a really happy life. We can't do that. That's completely unethical. So sometimes experimental designs aren't possible. I'm just going to skip some of this because it's just going through that logic of causality, you know, directionality, preceding. I'm just going to skip all that. Um, but this is that idea of experimental design, which will come through next semester. Sometimes you can do an experimental design where you can carefully control everything, and that's awesome. But sometimes you can't. All right. Correlate bottom line for these correlations before we go into these beyond analyses. Correlational research is important for examining phenomena that can't be manipulated. A lot of our things we can't manipulate, right? And, and in this research study, can you manipulate how addicted someone is to social media? No, you can't, right? In your sample, can you manipulate how much exercise your participants did or what they think about exercise? No, you can't. Some things we can't manipulate. And analyses like correlations and some of the other ones you'll see today are great for getting at these relationships for things that we can't manipulate. A strong correlation combined with theory often does hint at a causal relationship. Mind you, this says causal, not casual. So a, you know, a strong correlation in your research, if it goes along with theory, you can sometimes imply causal relationships, or you can say this causes that. But in order to truly state that, you need to do an experimental study or look at our other things for causality. But because of that third variable explanation, you must be very careful to think about other potential explanations. So you never, just because you run one correlation, you never say, hey, exercise causes self-esteem in our sample. You can never say that because there's so many other things that could be happening. And these other things that could be happening, especially if you got a, um, a, uh, a result that goes against your hypothesis, this is something to talk about in your discussion. These other third variables that could be causing your variables to be related or not related. That's something to think about for your discussion, this third variable problem. All right, let's go on to, let's see, what do we have left? Let me look at my notes. All right, let's go through in the remaining 10 minutes that we have, let's talk about some beyond relationships. Let's see, what do I wanna talk about here? Let's go on. I'm combining a bunch of PowerPoints together. Some variables can't be manipulated because of ethical considerations like we talked about, technical limitations, you know, some, it just might be impossible. 
Uh, you could do a longitudinal study. So longitudinal studies investigate change or they investigate variables um, across you know, time. That gets an idea of causality of something preceding the effect, right? So if you measure social media and depression at time one, and then I measure it again a year later, I can look at, okay, well, does social media addiction at time one, is that related to depression later after controlling for depression now? This idea won't be on an exam. This is just the logic of a longitudinal study. That won't be on an exam. Just know you could, or this understand, I guess, I don't know, just in your head, right, for future knowledge, longitudinal studies, that's the logic of it. Look at something at time one, see how that uh, predicts change at time two. All right, so let's talk about some of these beyond analyses. So this idea of a regression is actually very similar to a correlation. Has anyone ever heard of a regression before? Give me a thumbs up in chat if you've heard of it. Okay, couple one or two, a couple people throwing throwing some th throwing some thumbs up. Jeez, I can't speak today. Throwing thumbs up. But a regression is this key idea is if two variables are correlated, then one variable could be used to predict the other variable. Right? If I know one variable, can I predict another variable? And we kind of this that line of best fit in a scatter plot is just a regression line. See, some of you have kind of already done it if you have that line of best fit. You've already kind of done a regression. So statistically, regression is a statistical technique for finding the straight line that best fits a set of data. This regression line, and I'll show you one in a scatter plot, describes the value of y. So, you know, the value that the, whatever you have measured on your y axis that is most likely for each possible value of x based on the sample data. So let me show you a picture. All right, so predicting GPA in college from IQ. From IQ. So there's a positive correlation of 0.76, right? It's significant and it's positive. So higher IQ or higher GPA or higher IQ leads to higher GPA. So a regression analysis would allow us to predict someone's GPA by knowing their IQ. And there's like mathematically, you know, there's equations, I'm not gonna get into that. But, so here's a simple scatter plot of IQ on the bottom and GPA. Now, some of you already do this on your scatter plot, which is fine, but you plotted this best fit line. And this, which, this best fit line, it just like summarizes this data, right? These, these scatter plot, and it kind of just puts it right through the middle of all the data points a straight linear relationship. And what this does, this line essentially states, right, mathematically what it states is, if I were to go to X, 120 IQ, I could predict that if I get a incoming student, right, an incoming freshman with an IQ of 120, I could predict their GPA a year later, whatever it is, to be about 3.5 or whatever this line is, 3.5. Two, five, whatever it is. So the idea of a regression is if you know one variable, a score of one variable, can I predict the score on another variable? It's an interesting concept, right? If I know someone's uh, high school GPA, can I predict their college GPA? Or if I know someone's SAT score, can I predict what their grade will be on the final exam of Psych 203. This is the idea of a regression. So, and I, and I talked about moderation and mediation, I think on the first day, um, the first day of class, but here's some other now. So we can do a regression, right? Does this predict that? Well, so does social media use predict depression? It does. But maybe I want to know, does this relationship differ by gender? Do boys and girls differ on this relationship? So I can do a moderation. And what's the moderation show? This is just a graphically. I'm not going to show you numerically just because it's a lot of output. But, numer but graphically, we can see, hey, there's no... So we plotted social media addiction on the bottom, low to high, and depression, low to high up here on the y-axis. And we can see for males, 
as we become more addicted, males don't really gain in depression at all, right? It's kind of a straight line, but for females, they really do. So more addicted females, this green dot up here, have high depression systems and low addicted females, this green dot right here, you know, has less depressive symptoms. So more social media addiction is related to more depression just for girls, but not more, but not boys. So that's that idea of moderation. Does this relationship differ for groups in your sample? Then I could do it even more. I could do a moderated moderation. I can moderate that moderator. And this is that idea again, this is actually my uh, paper I'm writing, but lonely boys benefit from being addicted to social media. So lonely boys, this dot right here, actually have lower depression with more addiction. That's actually really interesting, right? Boys, lonely boys who are addicted have less depression than lonely boys who aren't addicted. Huh, that's weird. And that, and that relationship, that loneliness relationship only exists for males and not females. You could also do something called mediation, where I know that social media addiction is related to depression, but why? Why is it related? And this is kind of that third variable, but social media addiction causes people to um, engage in more upward social comparisons more upward social comparisons is related to depression. So the idea of mediation is saying, hey, I know two things are related, but why are they related? What is causing them to be related? And that's the idea of mediation. And I can moderate that mediation. So I could say, oh, hey, does this differ? Does this, you know, do males, are males more likely to engage in upward social comparisons? Turns out, no, females make are great at doing, at comparing themselves to others. Uh, females do it a lot. So do males, but females do, especially adolescent females, they do it a lot. Okay, so yeah, good, good point to end class. Just want to talk about some other analyses. You'll never have to do these in 204, this idea of moderation um, or mediation. These are advanced analyses for grad students, but just something that you can do. There's a whole other world of statistics out there. Um, yeah, before we end class, if you'd like to learn more about independent samples t-tests, uh, feel free to stay after class. So this is, um, if you want to run a t-test uh, in your own data, so if you want to see do boys and girls differ on my independent variable or my dependent variable, feel free to stay after class right now and I can talk about how to do that if you want to incorporate it in your paper. Other than that, um, be on the lookout, it should come out tomorrow, a study guide for the final exam. It will also include an example data set and some example questions for that open note section. I do want to mention before you go, um, an idea, I talked about this last class about how to create a study guide for the open note section, but what I suggest you do is go back to the assignments and the PowerPoints where I talk about how to do things or how to write up APA write up, because that's going to be kind of the big things that you'll have to do. So on the open note, one of the questions I may ask is, hey, create a, um, I don't know, a, a, um, a bar graph of this variable for this variable. And what you'll have to do is create a bar graph for that variable. And now some of you probably haven't memorized how to do it. But if you don't, I would highly suggest creating a cheat sheet or a Word document that has this stuff. And I would probably get rid of the stuff you don't need just so that way it just has exactly what you need to do. And maybe the, the, uh, the pictures, if you need pictures, if that's helpful for you. But I would have a Word document that says, hey, here's how you create a bar graph. Here's how you do a histogram and have it step-by-step step exactly what you need to do. Likewise, let me find the output. Likewise, I'd make sure that you know how to report stuff. Um, do I have, yeah, so I have this. So this is a great slide. So this slide tells you how to interpret a one samples t-test output and, exact, and, and the exact APA write-up. So I would suggest, you know, on your Word document, you have this picture and then you have this paragraph that goes with it. So that way, any, and maybe if you even want, you can highlight and point, hey, this number comes from here. This number comes from here, this number here, you know, so you know exactly where the numbers come in your APA write up from the, from the output. 
highly suggest you do this. Um, like have a cheat sheet with all this stuff ready to go because you're only gonna have like 30 minutes, 45, 40 ish minutes for this open note, completely doable. I know I'm way more advanced statistically than everyone, right? I teach this class. It would probably take me five minutes to do this final exam. Don't expect the open note, don't expect it to take you that quick, right? But it is doable in a short amount of time if you know what you're doing. If you don't know what you're doing, make sure you have a cheat sheet ready to go because trying to find this information and not having a cheat sheet, you're probably not gonna have enough time to do the final exam if you don't know where you're doing and you don't have a cheat sheet ready to go. So highly suggest you have one ready to go that lays stuff out step-by-step step exactly what you need to do and how to interpret the output. Because that is fine to have on the open note section and I highly suggest you have it. All right. That's it. I will see you. Um, when is it? When's the next class that we have? I will see you all next Monday. Um, feel free to stay after class if you have any questions or you want to talk about independent samples t-tests. Other than that, I will see you next Monday. Have a great weekend.